Hi, and uh, welcome to this video where we initiate the study of linear regression. So in this video, we'll try to motivate the definition of linear regression. And then in the next video, we'll go on to show how you can actually uh, solve linear regression. Okay, so just to motivate the problem, we'll revisit this example that we've been using in several of the previous videos where we want to predict the price of a house. So we're really dealing with a regression problem where we're predicting a value instead of a fixed class of category, which such as the, the price of a house. So the labels we're trying to predict in this case are real numbers or maybe positive real numbers or integers. So uh, what we saw in the previous video, just a quick recap, was these regression trees for, uh, for solving this problem, right? So, so regression trees were these trees where in the, in the notes you ask questions such as is feature A less than or equal to four? This create a, in this case, a vertical line that separates the data into two classes. And depending on the outcome of this comparison, you either just send to the left child or the right child. And then in, in, when you reach the leaves, uh, you return the value stored of the leaves. And we also saw for at least regression with a least squared loss, what you should return in the leaves would be the, the mean value of uh, all the points that end there, the labels that they have been assigned. So for instance, this right child here, the numbers uh, 9, 10, and 11 are the labels of the points that end there. So you would return the mean, which would be 10. And over here in the left leaf, the mean of 2 and 3 would be 2.5. So this would be uh, what you return. Okay. And regression trees are, are excellent for some types of data. For instance, this data set over here on, on the right, you can see uh, that it can easily be separated into a lower left corner where all the numbers are close to each other. And then the remaining part where uh, the numbers are also within that part uh, close to each other. So for instance, one could build a, a regression tree like this where you first compare on the first feature to form a, a vertical split. And if the comparison says you're greater than or equal to, then you have these three uh, values over here, 9, 10, and 11, you just have a leaf immediately. If you're less than or equal to uh, four on feature A, then you can do another comparison to split it into the top half and the bottom half, and again, return values immediately. So regression trees are, are obviously good for some types of data. And we'll see later on how you can also combine uh, regression trees to also perform well on data that doesn't necessarily look like this orthogonal subdivision. But for now, uh, at least it's good at this type of data. Now, there are also other types of data where maybe these regression trees do not perform so well. So here's another data set, uh, of course, an artificial one where we have a bunch of points. And as you can see here, if you draw a, this line here through the data, you can see that it could look like that the, uh, that the labels somehow depend on the distance to this line. Right? So everything above the line seems to be, have positive values for the most part part of all of them, in fact, and the further away you go from the line, the bigger the numbers get. Whereas on the other side, uh, most of them have negative numbers, maybe perhaps for, except for a single outlier here, and the further away you go from the line, maybe the values become more negative. Right? So this is also a type of data uh, that you could come across. And uh, maybe it would make sense to try to make predictions that somehow relate to the distance to this line or hyperplane that you're drawing. Okay. And this is really where uh, your linear regression comes into play. So linear regression, the basic idea, instead of using a regression tree, we'll go back to using these linear models as our hypotheses. Now, of course, this time we're not predicting a class, so we're not going to take the sign of some inner product. But what we're going to do instead is that we're still going to treat uh, our hypotheses as hyperplanes specified by a vector w, which is this normal vector here, and a bias b. And then when we want to make predictions, the predictions that we're going to make is we're still going to base them on this inner product with this vector w. So we're going to take for any given point x. If we want to predict its label, we're going to take the inner product between x and this vector w and then add the bias, right? So, so basically, the inner product with w tells us how far in the direction of w that we are. And the bias adds some extra value or subtracts some value from, from this estimate. Now, one important thing here that unlike the uh, case where we predicted a class called we took the sign of the inner product, there the scaling of W didn't really matter. But what you can see here is that if I scale W by a factor two or by, by a factor four, then the output prediction value, if we ignore the bias at least, would also scale by a factor two or four. So here uh, it's not scale invariant to the parameters that we put into W. Okay, so actually the, the length of this vector W will actually matter for the for the predictions. 
As you can see here, right, all these points here above the line, the further away you go from the line, the larger the inner product of W will be. And on the other hand, if you have points that sit on below this hyperplane, the further away you go in the uh, opposite direction of W, so still orthogonally away from, from the hyperplane, the more negative uh, your predictions will be. Okay, so this is really uh, what we, if we use a linear model to make predictions of values rather than classes, um, the, the prediction method actually simplifies. You just take the inner product between X and W and you add the bias. Okay, and the bias really, again, corresponds to the offset away from the origin of this hypoplane that we're using to, to make the predictions. Okay, so, so what you can see is, of course, this is a, not always a good model of the data, but it is if, if actually the data does look something like that the true label Y is some inner product between uh, your feature vector X and a vector w, or V plus some offset C, right? So if indeed the data was generated like this, then of course it makes sense to actually look for a model of this form, right? So, so any type of data where the, where the label is actually, uh, so the value that belongs to the label is really a linear combination of the input features, perhaps with different weighings on them, right? So in these cases, linear regression uh, would be a good choice of model. Okay. So, um, so maybe just for ease of visualization and understanding these linear models, when we visualize, at least uh, if we just have a single feature, there's a slightly simpler way of, of visualizing uh, the data. And that is if we actually, in this case, plot the label as an extra coordinate of the point, All right? So if for instance, if we have one dimensional data, uh, we could have uh, these four points here with feature A is what we use to plot along the x-axis. And if we now use the labels here, these are numbers now, so it makes sense to plot them as a second uh, axis. So we could do that. And then you can see that the data looks something like this. In this case, 0, 3, 10, and 12. You move them up on the y-axis to, to the corresponding value of the labels. Okay, so this is how we can think of visualizing uh, this data if the labels are actually values. We can just plot the, the actual label as the last dimension of the, of the points. So uh, if we think about linear regression again, then uh, we could maybe start with the 1D case where we have the labels as the y-axis and the single feature as the x-axis. If we're making predictions of this form, the inner product between the, the x and a vector w plus a bias, and we plot it in these d plus one dimensions with the last dimension being the label. And what we'll, we'll see is, at least in this example here, if we say, okay, let's say I have my vector w, it has just a single coordinate that say that coordinate is one. And let's say we have a bias of minus two. Then we know that for any given point uh, with a feature X1 for the first, this is the value of the first feature. The prediction that we're going to make is one times X1 minus two. And this is exactly a line, right? This is exactly the position on the line, a line with a slope of one and an offset of minus two on the Y axis. So this is exactly the line that we drew here. So which really means that when we're making predictions, given the value of the feature, we go to uh, that X coordinate, we go up to the line and then we predict the value at the line. Okay, so, so really this is the line X1 comma Y where Y satisfies this equality, right? So we're actually going to make the prediction uh, that corresponds to, to this. And also if we look in, in, let's try to visualize it, at least if we have two features, there's a feature X1, there's a feature uh, X2, and then we have the label plotted as the third dimension upwards. Then this prediction here is really predicting the value on the hyperplane, right? So, so it's going to, so here's the hyperplane, try to visualize it. And if we wanna make a prediction, the way we do it, if we have the D features of a, of a point, right? And we wanna predict its label, then what we do is that we actually look up on the hyperplane. So let's say this point has coordinate X1, coordinate X2. You just evaluate the hyperplane's Y coordinate, the last coordinate of the hyperplane at this uh, position X1, X2. And that actually gives uh, the prediction. So, so the hyperplane is really the one that looks like this. It's the set of points X1 to XD and Y where y is the prediction you would make on x1 to xd. So y is equal to x's inner product with w plus the bias, right? So this is the hyperplane. And then of course the prediction is just the last coordinate on this hyperplane. So it looks like something like this. If you wanted to predict the label of this point, what you would predict is 
uh, the place if you go vertically down onto until you hit the hypoplane and this this y coordinate that you have here that's the prediction that you would make okay so so this is simply because right the hypoplane is just a set of points where the last coordinate is actually the prediction you would make on the first d coordinates so again if you have a point you and you just know you know all of its coordinates you would go down onto the hypoplane and you would look up what is the prediction that you would make. Of course, this is not necessarily the true label, right? The true label, at least in this plot, would have been the y coordinate up here. So you, the mistake is really the difference between the coordinate up here, the y coordinate that it actually has, and uh, the position on the hypoplane. But this is how we make predictions. We have a hypoplane in d plus one dimensions. And uh, the last coordinate is really just the, uh, the prediction that we're going to make in terms of the label. Okay, so right. So the true label here is again visualized for 1D if we just have a single feature. Uh, the model that we trained is specified by the offset B and the vector W, which gives a line like in this picture here, namely the line W1, X1 plus B. Uh, and uh, this gives the Y coordinate, the last coordinate of the, of the hypoplane or the, the prediction that you're going to make. So which means that um, if you have points here with different features, different values of the first feature x1 given by the offset on the x-axis, the prediction that we're going to make is going to be the point that sits on the hyperplane, whereas the true label, the true prediction is, is really the black label up here, right? the, the y-coordinate uh, of the black point. Okay, so these different distances to the line or to the hyperplane are the mistakes that we're making in our predictions. So if we go back to the supervised learning setup that we talked about last time, just to, to recap, the general setup is that there's some unknown target distribution. So this is the fully general case where given a feature vector, there's just some distribution over labels, conditional distribution that we denote by P of Y given X. There's an unknown input distribution G D from which our training examples are drawn as independent samples X1 to Xn, all drawn from this distribution D. Uh, once we've drawn X1 to Xn, for each of them, we generate the label yi from this conditional distribution on the labels given the feature vector xi. So this gives us these n training examples, x1, y1, up to xn, yn. These are then fed into the learning algorithm, which searches through a hypothesis set and produces a final hypothesis h. And when we want to evaluate the quality of this final hypothesis, we look at what is the mistake that we expect H to make when we draw a new sample X from this unknown distribution D. And this is where we say that the training data is similar to the new data by saying that they come from the same unknown data distribution D. Okay. So we also talked about last time we motivated different loss functions. In particular, we saw that for regression problems, we often use the least squared loss. Okay, so the least squared loss again is, so we have these loss functions, they take two arguments, the uh, prediction y prime and the true label y, and then it has to return a penalty or loss, and in least squared loss, we return the squared difference between the prediction and the true value. Right, so if, for instance, if we're predicting the price of a house and the price is 5.15 million, and we predict 5.3 million, then uh, the least squared loss is the difference between the two number, which 150,000 squared. So this is the least squared loss function. And again, we defined last time the in-sample error. So just recall that uh, we have the input domain uh, that we denote by X. So that could be D-dimensional feature vectors, which it is in, in this case of linear regression. And then we had an output domain Y, which would be real numbers in this case. There was the unknown distribution D over the input domain. So this is where the feature vectors come from. There's an unknown target distribution that for any given feature vector x, there's a conditional distribution over the labels. So the label yi is drawn from this conditional distribution if, where we conditioned on uh, the feature vector xi. So really we receive these n examples, x1, y1 up to xn, yn. And then we in general, for a general loss function, we define the in-sample error of a concrete hypothesis h as the average over all these training examples of the loss applied to the prediction made by H on this feature vector Xi and the true label Yi. And this is what we know uh, when we have the training data. And if we use the concrete loss function, least squared loss, uh, 
then the in-sample error is just the average over all the training examples of the square difference between the prediction h of xi and the true label yi. Okay, so this is for least squared loss. This is the in-sample error. The outer sample error we define similarly, right? We still have this unknown distribution d. We still have this unknown target distribution uh, p of y given x. And for general loss functions, we define the outer sample error as the expectation over a new uh, point x drawn from this unknown distribution d and a label y drawn from the conditional distribution p of y given x. And then, so we draw such an example a point, and then we look at the expected value of the loss function applied to the prediction made by the hypothesis on x and the true label y. And again, for least squared loss, this means that the outer sample error that we want to minimize is just the expectation over a new data point consisting of both a feature vector x and uh, a label y, which is a, a real number, but the expectation of the squared difference between the prediction and the true label. Right? So this makes sense that this is what we'd like to minimize, the expected loss, the expected square difference between the prediction and the true label when we draw a new data point that we haven't seen before. Okay. So again, linear regression, right? If we go back to this picture, uh, the true labels, again, uh, visualized here is the y coordinate as the d plus first coordinate and the predictions that we're going to make are going to correspond to we have a hyperplane or a line in 2d and whenever we want to make a prediction we know all about the last coordinate so we go to the hyperplane and predict the last coordinate of the hyperplane at that position so we're going to predict these hollow circles here uh, given just the the x1 uh, value like the x coordinate of, of a point because those are the only ones that are available to us when we make new predictions. And now again, if we wanted to, what we really want to minimize is this uh, out of sample error, right? So this is the expectation over a new data point of, so here we have the prediction when we want to do uh, linear regression, right? Our prediction is always the inner product between the feature vector x and the parameters w plus the bias. So this is the prediction. So track this off from the true label and we square it. And this is what we'd like to minimize. Okay. Now, instead, as we motivated last time in the learning theory uh, video, what we want to do instead is we want to minimize the in-sample error because this is the one where we actually have the labels available, right? We don't know what a new data point looks like. We don't know the distribution D. We don't know the conditional distribution P of Y given X. So what we can minimize is just the in-sample error. The in-sample error was, again, the average over all the training examples of uh, this prediction, which, again, was the inner product between the feature vector xi and w plus the bias minus the true label yi, and then we square it. So this is what our goal to minimize this in-sample error. Okay, so let us just also recall the small trick that we had last time, uh, maybe a couple of lectures ago when we had uh, the perceptron learning algorithm. And... This observation was that in general, if we're doing regression here, we have features x1 to xd, the labels are real numbers. The parameters of a hypothesis are really all the parameters of w and the bias. And the predictions that we're going to make again was this basically inner product between x and w, so w1 x1 plus w2 x2, all the way up to w d xd plus the bias. And as we said last time, it was a little bit annoying to carry around the special bias parameter b. So what we could do, and we'll just revisit this trick, is that we could add an extra coordinate to our uh, data set, an extra feature to our data. And so we just hard code a special feature that's always one, right? And just to, to recall, right, this is not the same as when we're visualizing this data for linear regression that we plot the D plus first coordinate as the label, right? This is an extra uh, feature that we hard code to one. So really, if we wanted to plot it, it would be D plus two dimensional. And so this is a special feature that we just use to get rid of the bias. Uh, we just always hard code the first coordinate to one. And then we just have to remember to do this also when we're making predictions on new data, we hard code this first coordinate to one. And then the parameters are just W0 to WD. And when we make predictions, we're just gonna take the inner product between X and W, just remembering that we've always hard coded this first coordinate to, to one. So this W0 will really act as the bias, right? So it's just a hack to get rid of the, the special bias. So models now are just making predictions in a product between a feature vector X and a set of parameters W. That's how we make predictions, only in a products, no, no bias. And just remember, always hard code a feature to one. Okay, so this simplifies the picture a little bit. 
So our predictions are now in a product between X and W. And uh, what we'd like to minimize again is uh, this expectation over a new point of the square difference between X is in a product W and Y. Uh, but this we cannot do because we don't know the distribution. So what it really minimizes the ensemble error, which is again, the average over all the training points, the prediction X is in a product with W minus Y. You square this. Now, here it's visualized if we had a single uh, feature X and uh, Y coordinate Y. Here we do carry around a, a bias parameter. We would really transform this into a data set that has two features instead of just one. All these black points, they would get an extra coordinate that's hard coded to one. And this would simulate this bias that we have here. Okay. So the goal is to minimize this ensemble error. Okay, the average of the square difference between the inner product with W and with YI, where we hard coded a special feature to one. And just to simplify this a little bit, or maybe it seems a little bit more natural, uh, when we're minimizing such as a, a sum with a constant scaling factor in front, a scaling factor uh, one over N, this is just the same as minimizing the, without the one over N. Okay, so this is just, to simplify matters a little bit. So let's just get rid of this one over n because this is the same minimization problem. Just minimizing the sum of the square differences between the prediction and the true label. So the prediction is the inner product, right? So what are these square differences, right? If we look at this picture again, what we said was that when we give it a feature rate x, the prediction that we're going to make is the value of the hyperplane at that x. Right? So this is the last, uh, the y coordinate here. And the true label is the yi, right? So the true label is the black one. And we are uh, the summing the square differences. So really what we're summing here, if we draw the line, is that we, we have the vertical line down onto the hyperplane. This has some length. And what we're summing is the square of all these lengths, right? So it's the sum of the squared lengths of these uh, red vertical uh, line segments. This is what we're trying to minimize. So we're trying to find the hyperplane that minimizes the sum of these squared uh, vertical lines from the true label down onto the hyperplane. Okay, so this is what we're trying to minimize. And let me just before uh, we stop this uh, video where we introduce the problem of linear regression, let us just rewrite it in a perhaps more convenient matrix vector notation uh, so that we arrive at the final minimization problem that we then uh, see how we can solve in the next video. Okay, so maybe if we just go back to recall from a few videos ago, uh, we talked about at least as object oriented programming, what would a machine learning model look like or a classifier? We could also use a, a, re, a regressor instead of a classifier and still talk about this uh, interface, right? So really it had two methods, a fit method and a predict method. And in the fit method, if we want to be consistent, at least with previous notation, what we did was that we, we said that the data was presented as a matrix X, where the training data would be the rows of the matrix. So if I had training examples X1, Y1 up to Xn, Yn, then X would have these N rows where each of the rows would just be a feature vector, right? So it has N rows, it has D columns, one for each of the features, and this would be the data matrix. Uh, again, if we had this hard coding trick, the very first column of this matrix would be an all ones column. Right, where we hard code the first feature. And then the yi's, right, would just be a vector whose coordinates give all the true labels, right? So it's just a vector of real numbers. Right, so this is the kind of uh, notation we'll try to use when we define a linear regression problem. We'll try to represent the data as a matrix X and the labels as a vector Y. So we want to minimize this expression here, uh, the sum of all the points of uh, the inner product between W and, and Xi minus the label y i squared. So again, the data matrix using the notation from the previous uh, slide would look like this, right? So on the first row, you would have, have the first feature vector x1. The second row, you would have the second feature vector all the way down to the nth feature vector with d different features. The y vector is a column vector with entries uh, y1 to yn. And w, the parameters that we're looking for, could also be thought of as a column vector with the parameters w1 to wd. Now, let us look at this expression here. If we look at x times w minus y, what is this expression here? So this is going to be a vector. So if we just look at x times w, right, the way we do a matrix vector product is that we're going to take uh, the vector w over here. It's a column vector, and we're going to uh, 
the first entry of the product here is going to be the inner product between W and the first row, which is X1. Right? So the first entry of X times W is really just X1's inner product with W, which conveniently is the prediction that we're going to make on X1 given the parameters W. And if we go down in all the, the rows, right, each of these rows, the ith row will just, if we look at just X times W, will be XI's inner product with W. Now, when we subtract y, this is an entry y subtraction between vectors. So this would give us this vector x1's inner product with w minus y1 all the way down to xn's inner product with w minus yn. Now, this looks almost on the form of what it is that we're trying to minimize. We just now need to sum the squares of these entries. And actually, with ve matrix vector notation, uh, that's a really convenient way uh, that we can write this. So what we can do now is if we look at this vector here, this x, w minus y, if we look at its inner product with itself, now the inner product with itself is just going to be the sum over all the coordinates of that coordinate squared. Now, so if we sum over all the coordinates, right, we're first going to take this first coordinate, x1's inner product with w minus y1, and we're going to square it. And then we're going to sum that over all the coordinates. And what we can see here is that we actually end up with precisely uh, this goal that we're trying to minimize, right? Uh, an n factor times the ensemble error. So really what we're trying to minimize is really, we wanna find this W minimizing X W minus Y's inner product with itself. That is the goal that we're trying to, to minimize, right? So, so this is what we'll set out to minimize the inner product between X W and Y with itself. Right. This is the least squared uh, regression problem. How do we find W uh, that minimizes this value?